personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, my name is Debbie Reynolds. They call me the Data Diva. This is the Data Diva Talk Privacy Podcast, where we discuss data privacy issues with industry leaders around the world with information the business needs to know right now. I have a special guest on the show today. Uh, we have Wayne Lloyd, um, who is the CEO and founder of Smarter Contracts. Um, Wayne and I had the pleasure of having a chat uh, a few weeks ago, and I thought, oh my goodness, he'd be a great person to have on the show. You have such a great perspective about privacy and sort of uh, kind of what's going on in the world and how you are addressing that um, uh, with your company. So without further ado, why don't you start by sort of telling me how you sort of ended up uh, here, uh, you know, what was your journey into privacy and sort of why you moved into this area? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks a lot for having me. Um, first of all, it's, um, you know, we, we, we listen to your podcast a lot, so, um, really appreciate you inviting us on the, on the show. So we've had some pretty, we had a really interesting conversation about, um, you know, smarter contracts, consent management, uh, sort of the, the nature of consent and why consent is really interesting. And so you you all have a patent pending consent management uh, platform, but I'd really be interested in talking initially about sort of your journey uh, into, you know, becoming the founder and CEO of smart contracts or sort of, you know, what was your trajectory in your career and what were the needs that you were seeing when you decided to start the company? Sure. Um, yeah, so the, um, yeah, my, my route into privacy was um, quite protracted. So my background's always been in financial services. I've worked for banks, I've worked for consultancies, um, but it was around 10 years ago when I started working for a consultancy um, that provided services to banks that were using, I suppose, centralized treasury management systems and, and banking platforms. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to work with banks in uh, particularly in uh, emerging um, economies. Um, and what I was able to, to, to see was that they were given these, I suppose, these centralized technology platforms and the support that they were given um, when they were utilizing these platforms was, was, was sometimes um, quite in, um, inappropriate for the way in which they needed to, to manage their customers' expectations. And I, ju I just couldn't really understand how you know, this was being allowed to happen. So I started looking for new and emerging technologies that I felt could improve these customer experiences. Um, and then I really got into blockchain. Um, I discovered that in 2015, and that was that was really my calling. So um, when I started talking to banks about blockchain back then, it was um, you know people looked at me kind of funny. What um, what, what you're talking about? So I needed to um, I need to understand how to really think about how we could um, sell uh, solutions using blockchain to organisations, and, and I joined an organisation that specialised in digital business transformation. And they were brilliant because they um, really helped me frame how the technology could be used to improve the way in which businesses um, provided services to their end users. Um, and as I, as I learned more about digital business transformation, what I began to realize was that in a lot of cases, digital business transformation had become almost a segue into how can I make customers spend money with me faster? Um, so they were going from A to B, but they weren't actually thinking about the impact that these new digital experiences would have on their end users if their data was hacked or if, um, you know, if um, the, the worst things were, were to happen. And obviously we, we can see that they do. So it was when I layered blockchain on top of this and I started thinking about privacy and security and, you know, creating trust in those digital experiences that we really started getting into privacy. And um, yeah, I established uh, Smarter Contracts. Um, and then we really started looking at uh, open data initiatives. And then we started looking at the role that consent plays within the sharing of data. 
Um, and out of that, we've developed Pulse um, and, and that's where, where we are with it today. That's how I got there. So it's a long, long way, but um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> totally. Uh, I think it's interesting uh, that you have a financial uh, background because I think when we chatted before, you talked about managing data like money. Um, yes. and so to me, this is a concept I think is really fascinating because, you know, I, when I think about it, you know, I, I like that analogy a, a lot because, you know, it's about, you know, the, the fact that individuals own their data, right? Just like they own their money. And then when they give their data to someone else, they expect them to be a good steward with their mm-hmm. data. So it shouldn't be, you know, like if you were to go to a bank and then you put money in a bank and then you ask them, so, you know, what's my can I see my account balance or whatever? And they say, well, we don't know where money is. You know, you'd be really upset. So I, I like that analogy. So, so tell me a little bit about your idea about how kind of the data like money um, analogy goes for you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so when we were designing Pulse, um, we felt that we needed to do it um, from the point of view of, of a customer, um, you know, we're, we're, I'm not, I don't have a, a background in privacy and I'm not a lawyer, um, but what I am is a customer and I understand how I expect my data to be managed um, and, and, and looked after. And so what we did with Pulse, um, you know, we, we built it from the point of view of the customer first with empathy at the heart of the user experiences that we were designing. And then we thought about the technology second. But what we did know as we started that journey is that, you know, blockchain can take um, back office processes and make them front and center to the user experience. And when you think about how that technology can unlock certain uh, user experiences, you then start to realize and recognize just how much more beautiful privacy can be for individuals if you start thinking about how to manage or how to allow the individual to manage their expectations around how their data should be managed. So as we were looking um, at you know, existing financial service providers and we started thinking about the value of data, um, we started to recognize, well, look, our data is worth more often than the money that we spend, but there are no effective ways of managing that data in the same way that we can manage our cash. Um, And for organizations that are managing privacy and the expectations of the end users, we believe that managing an individual's appetite for privacy and control over their data should be a real time exercise. If you break somebody's trust, it can't be something that you manage after the trust has been broken because the trust has been broken. There's no there's no repairing that. Or if you do, it's going to take a long time. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to make sure that the individual had the opportunity to set their trust parameters controlled by them so they could manage it in the same way that they manage their cash. Um, and I think it's a real USP for, for um, you know, for financial service providers now. So, you know, we've done our own research. There's a lot of research that's out there. But, you know, the research that we've done, um, we found, you know, 42 percent of the people that we've spoken to um, you know, they changed their bank if they provided uh, better privacy tools. Um, and of the, you know, the, the 50 so percent left, 30 percent. Everybody starts in talking about these amazing interactive privacy tools that they can use. People will still will start to manage privacy more. Um, and then that's laid on top where 75 percent of the people we spoke to want complete control over their data. So there's a there's a shift now to being able to manage, I think, uh, data in the same way that, that you know you manage your your money. Right, I agree. Uh, and then too, you know, I like to talk about something, and I've been talking about this for years, which is kind of the rise of the individual, uh, where mm-hmm. businesses before were, you know, once they got data, it sort of went all over the place. And so and they thought of it as if, you know, they own the data uh, in, a, in a way they sort of did own the data, right? Yeah. Um, because they didn't have these additional 
um, obligations to the individual. So now that, uh, you know, all around the world, uh, countries and different, you know, states and municipalities, even cities are passing these regulations that are saying, you know, individuals have these rights, businesses have these obligations to sort of let them know. And so it's sort of turning business on its head because I think when, um, especially when, when when there was talk about what was happening with the GDPR in Europe, especially in the U.S. between 2016 and 2018. So that was between the time that uh, GDPR went, became a law and then the time that it went into full uh, enforcement, right, in May 2018. Um, people sort of, some companies thought about sort of what was happening with the EU and the GDPR as though, well, this is something that, you know, it's, it's kind of this new obligation, this is new regulation, and we kind of tack things on to it, perhaps, yes. right? to whatever our business process was. But because uh, privacy is so fundamental, it's important that, you know, companies, they really need to change the way that they operate. And so it's, it's a huge, it's a more, uh, it's a more vast change. And so I think yeah. that as companies are seeing over the years, how these things are playing out, um, uh, that, you know, privacy isn't sort of like something you could sprinkle on top of whatever you're doing. It definitely is a fundamental change in the way that you operate. What are your thoughts? No, I, I, I agree. And um, look, it's not, it's not going to happen overnight. I think first and foremost, um, there needs to be an understanding that privacy sits on a scale, right? So what, what's privacy for somebody else is, is some, something for, for, for the next person. But I think what we're finding, you know, especially the academic studies that we're reading um, and, and have enjoyed reading over the past two and a bit years is, I think privacy defined uh, means control. That, that is what privacy really fundamentally means. So I have control over my data and therefore I can set the parameters around how much privacy or control I, I, I feel I should have. But I think for organizations, um, it, it's, it's quite a paradox right now. If, if you think, think about, it's particularly within the UK, we've got a lot of open data initiatives, open energy, open banking, open finance. We're in a situation where in order to, for those um, initiatives to thrive, we want people to share more of their data at a point in time when people are less certain about sharing their data than ever before. It's quite, it's quite paradox. And these organizations are going to be sharing their data within these open data initiatives. But right now, they're not even open businesses. You know, so you think about the silos within those, uh, within those uh, organizations. They're not sharing data between themselves effectively, but yet they're now going to have to share their data with third parties. And they've got to manage that and they've got to be competitive. Um, I think what businesses need to do is I think they need to start thinking about themselves as a, as a business and how they share data across their silos first, um, and then focus on delivery by running, I suppose, pilots before they scale. So they, they're going to have to do it incrementally. They can't just do a big bang, you know, and, and just everything will be will be okay. I think it's just going to take time for them to sort of um, um, to address it. Um, yeah. Well, actually, yeah. Let, let me back up a bit. Uh, so you mentioned something that I think probably deserves a bit more um, uh, uh, scrutiny, which is sort of open, the open banking, open everything sort of initiative. So we don't have that here uh, in yeah. the U.S. So and I did a video about this several months ago about what was happening in like open banking and in the EU and also um, in India. So can you talk a little bit just at a high level, you know, what is kind of the open banking or the open initiatives that, that require data sharing? And what are you seeing in those areas again? Yeah, sure. So um, I suppose the, obviously the European Revised Payment Services Directive, PSD2, um, it came about in October 2015. It mandated the opening up of, um, of banking data to third-party providers. 
Um, and this made it possible for uh, third party providers to directly access transaction data or create payments on behalf of customers. Um, and it was done on the basis of uh, driving greater competition in financial markets. Um, and that would improve outcomes for customers by saving them cash, giving them more personalized products and services. Um, and in August 2016, the CMA or the Competition and Markets Authority, uh, they mandated that the UK's nine largest retail banks should fund an organization with the create, a, I suppose, common standards and interfaces for, for PSD2 open banking access, um, and that those banks should implement those standards. Um, and the open banking implementation entity, which was set up to implement those standards, have done an amazing job of, of doing that. They're close to finalizing those sets. Um, well, they, they've just done the last one. They've done the um, open banking standards um, and they maintain a directory um, of compliant applications. So TPPs can authenticate the application to account servicing payment service providers um, or, or banks. Um, so that, 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 in essence, is... Um, what's happened and how it's been implemented. Um, as of, I suppose, January 2021, there was more than 3 million customers. The, the number of um, customers is growing, the number of API calls is growing, and the number of products and services and innovations is just exciting. It's, it's brilliant to be part of it um, and to see how people are, are using open banking to tailor products and services for individuals. Um, but one of the things, obviously, in order to transfer that data, you need to um, obviously give consent for that data to be shared. Um, you need to do it and you need to ensure that the, the customer understands why they're sharing their data and what they get in return for that. And at the moment, um, there are there's not a common dashboard, if you like. So there's different standards for consent management within open banking at this moment in time. Um, and we think it's such a fundamental part of it, which is why we wrote a white paper on, um, you know, raising the concerns that we have about these different standards of consent management within open banking, because what, what we don't want within open banking is, um, if you think about um, cookies as an example, and you've got multiple different providers uh, of cookie dashboards, uh, you don't know where your cookies are going, how you manage them. There's not a single way of managing your cookie consent. You just kind of feel out of control. Um, and with open banking, what we want is for people to be confident to sharing their banking and transaction data um, and to be comfortable that these open data initiatives will give them, um, you know, the, the, the type of um, personalized products and services that they value. I love your... Um, I love what you talked about in terms of open banking. So, um, you know, it's, it is, I, I thought it was very ambitious and I was happy to see, you know, the EU sort of going in this direction because it is difficult, right? Where businesses have been very siloed before and, you know, a lot of the smaller players weren't able to sort of get in on the action and be able to access customers. So that creates a lot of complicated data issues yeah. and consent issues so i'm glad to see that these initiatives are going forward and you know it's being done in a, in a way and you guys like you said you, you wrote you know a paper about sort of you know you know consent and managing you know that process and being able to um uh protect the rights of individuals um i, I would love to talk a bit about uh, let's just talk about consent, right? Uh, just consent in general. So consent to me is very interesting and it's complicated. And I'm seeing how companies are kind of playing around with kind of what consent means. So, yeah. you know, as we know, under the GDPR, consent is a legal basis, right, for data transfer. And so uh, in the U.S., what we're seeing, we're seeing, um, states pass laws. Well, let me back up. In the U.S., a lot of what companies would do in the past about data or with people's data, all they had to do was really kind of notify them. So, you know, whether it was a sign or a letter that they got in the mail, they're like, hey, we're going to do this with your data. So what we're seeing in the U.S., we're seeing a lot of 
we're seeing state, some states pass more comprehensive um, uh, data privacy legislation where those uh, laws are calling for consent. And this is kind of a new thing, you know, in the U.S. is very different. So consent is very, you know, consent, as I said, in, in uh, the GDPR is kind of a legal basis. So we're kind of feeling our, our way around, Con, you know, we, so, so right now in the U.S., we have kind of a notice slash consent thing going. Um, and so it seems like the regulations are all going towards consent now, but it's not, uh, national. So we don't have a national, you know, data privacy or data protection um, uh, um, law right now that covers kind of consumers. So we're kind of getting these bit dribs and drabs of regulations. Anyway, I think the thing that interests me or the thing that I feel is complex about consent is that um, Consent doesn't necessarily, in my view, um, uh, cover or address whether the thing that someone is consenting to is in their best interest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I, I love, you know, so because you work in this space, you know, and you know a lot about consent. You know, what, just give me your, your take on it. That's what I think. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Consent, databases of consent are databases of dirty data. That's essentially what consent databases are today. And, you know, for the reasons that we just spoke about when we're talking about cookies and you're out of control, you know, in terms of the um, the number of dashboards that you're using and where that data goes. And But, yeah, you, you're, you're completely right. There is a... Um, there is a, a problem that needs to be addressed, which is people need to understand what they're saying yes to or what they're saying no to. And we, we recognize this at a very early stage at, at Smarter Contracts and we're, we're kind of um, seven months in uh, building an additional module to the core um, Pulse platform, which really addresses um, how people are saying yes or no to the questions that they're being asked. Um, and yeah, I, you know, that, that's my view on it. it. It's a problem. It's a problem that needs to be solved. Um, and uh, the sooner it's solved, the, the better. Yeah, I feel like some companies are using consent against people. So yeah. either getting them to consent because, it, you know, like, let's say I'm at a website, I want to do a transaction or something. And then I get all these, you know, do you consent? You know, yes, yes, yes. And then you know, maybe I want to get through my transaction faster. And so not consenting makes slows down or creates more friction. So people say yes, or people don't really understand what they're saying yes to. And then they're sorry later, or they're upset later that, okay, I didn't understand that when I said yes to this thing, you know, this is what was the result. So, you know, to me, that's a problem. And And then too, there's, there's a, a natural asymmetrical relationship, in my opinion, between customers and businesses. So, um, you know, there, you know, when, when businesses ask for data, especially in a consent um, um, type of regime, you know, they can ask for more and give less, right? So it's yeah. not an even exchange under any circumstances. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think, that, but this is where, this is where building consent management with the customer at the heart um, of the design is the, is the really important thing. So there's two ways that you can think about the customers in the process of asking for consent. You can design something and think about how you can, for example, annoy the customer and create a trade-off between accessing the information and just clicking yes to just get this pop-up out the way, for, as an example. Or you can really think about how you can extract user experiences to drive trust that they'll always want to come back to work, you know, come back and engage with your products. And I think if you 
you know, the, the things that annoy me, for example, when, I, when I'm looking at cookies, um, which is, is, is not the core of our business cookie consents, but um, if you look at um, websites, when you go on, it's, all, it's always just seems to be a fraction of a second that these pop-ups come up just as you start reading these, um, you know, articles that you want to read or before you interact with the services that you're after. And it's obviously it creates a, a trade-off, which is I'll just click yes, that will remove itself and I'll read the article. Um, that's, a, that's a good customer experience for the people who want your data, but it's a bad customer experience for the person who's just given their data away. And even, you know, um, today I was talking to, to, to uh, a member of the team who's looking at one cookie pop-up and there was, I think, for just one transaction, there was 278 data aggregators at the back end of it that had an individual data uh, privacy policy that related to each individual organization. So it's not just that you give it away once to one organization, you give it away 278 times when you say yes in some instances. The way that we've built and designed um, the platform ourselves is to make sure that it's not free for all with your data and therefore you'll you, you'll be more um, you know, it's, it's impossible to configure the platform in a way which is not compliant um, and you'll be marked down against it if you do um, by, by, by smarter contracts. So it's, um, it's a different way. It's turning it on its head, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And I love to talk about, we had a conversation about this. Um, I did a video a bit ago about incremental consent. Yeah. Um, and so you had kind of, I thought your take on it was really fascinating. So uh, it actually helped me a lot because it was, this is something that I was seeing and I decided to kind of do this video about it and people yeah. really love the video uh, yeah, that story, I sort yeah. of talked yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, tell me your thoughts about incremental consent or, uh, well, actually before that, I'll sort of explain what I think it is and then you <laughs> sort of tell me whether I'm right or wrong. So I was just kind of seeing how companies are asking for consent for teeny small things uh, and they're asking for consent more often. So sometimes, so there, I, to me, there was like two schools of thoughts about this. So one is, you know, the reason why companies are asking for consent incrementally is because maybe they're developing a product and it's only at a certain point and then they decide they want to ask consent. They, gather more data so as you know to me that's kind of a legitimate way that companies will ask for a consent right but then yeah. the other the flip side this is what I was really talking about was I feel like companies in some ways are asking for consent incrementally because if you they told you the whole <laughs> deal about what they wanted to do with your data you probably just say no so yeah. in a way they're kind of it's, to me it's like a building block of consent in a way so it's like mm -hmm. okay you consent to this one thing and then we move to the next thing and we move to the next thing to, and to me it sort of makes it harder for the person to withdraw consent because now it's kind of this building block of things that they've agreed to what are your thoughts yeah I it's interesting isn't it I think when we spoke about it last time, Debbie, I think the, the, the incremental consent analogy that I sort of discussed was over time, what I have said yes to, for example, on social media platforms has changed incrementally. Um, and for example, if you post your photo on some social media platforms, you don't own your photos anymore because the consents that you've given incrementally have loosened the control that you have over your own personal items and they've been taken away from you. And this is really the driving force of what we see within uh, open banking. We, what we don't want is to see incremental consents that loosen your control over your transaction and banking data. You know, the, if, if there is always, we need this for this and that, Ultimately, what happens, the customer becomes out of control with what they're saying yes to. They kind of lose track of it. And I think over time, it lessens the privacy that they have. And as we go into these open data initiatives and you're giving away more and more of your personal and private information, it's just, you know, particularly for vulnerable people who, who really need protection, they need, their, you know, they really need privacy. I think they need to have more control over how their data is being used. And I think, like you say, you just, 
build up more and more incremental consents, it just kind of, um, you know, could have the, um, the opposite effect. It also frustrates the user experience. I don't know if you go on the, you know, the very famous search engine. Every time I seem to search for something now, they want to just, just reconfirm that I'm happy to not give them access to, um, to my data, which is just rubbish. You know, it just ruins the user experience. Um, and I think these organizations that are thinking about this as a way of maybe, you know, potentially loosening people's control by sort of doing this incremental um, consent process. You know, I think people are voting with their feet now and everybody knows about DuckDuckGo and their success. You know, people will move to privacy enhancing platforms if the option is there. People have moved away from, you know, WhatsApp to Telegram and Signal because they're concerned about how their data is being shared and used. You know, people are using the Brave browser. People are voting with their feet. And what they're showing is that if it's really easy to move away from um, organizations that demonstrate an inability to value your privacy over to organizations that provide privacy enhancing products and services that are as easy to use as your existing applications or, or desktop um, platforms, they'll move. There's no loyalty there. They'll, they'll move instantly. So. Um, to answer your question about yeah incremental consent, I do see it as a problem. Um, I do think it's something that needs to be addressed, and it's it's definitely very much in the thinking about you know how we how we manage that. Um, but yeah, I do think that it, again, if it's um, if incremental consent is used as a way of loosening privacy, then ultimately I think it will be the businesses that lose this time round. Yeah, I I, I guess. Uh, consent in general troubles me for many different reasons, but two probably big reasons are, you, you know, um, I saw on a website called the Fido Alliance, uh, which is Fast ID Online, so it tries to get people to log on in more secure ways that have less friction. They were saying like kind of the average person has like 90 login and passwords to accounts, right? So mm -hmm. the massive amount of accounts that people have and the massive amount of questions that they ask is to me, it's just, you can't really manage all that. You know, I think one yeah. individual can't really effectively, no one's going into 90 accounts and like reconfiguring their privacy stuff. So yeah. being able to do it in a way where say like I, I always say having a person have a bank, like be a, you know, their data is like a bank, right, of yep. their own. And then the companies come to them and ask for consent. And that way they can see, individuals can see what they've consented to and what they haven't. And then they can yep. change those controls. Yep. Um, and then also, and this is another thing that troubles me, and this is kind of about contracts, right? Um, so when you're consenting to things, you're sort of entering many little contracts with companies about what you do, what they're going to do with your data. And then ultimately something may happen that you didn't, you don't like, right? And you're yeah. like, I can't believe that, you know, when I read whatever, you know, if you read the privacy policy or if you read, you know, the consent thing or whatever, you didn't really comprehend that what you said yes to resulted in what the company ultimately did with your data. And yeah. so and then, then it's sort of a thing like, well, you should have like read these 80 pages of, <laughs> you know, terms and conditions. So to me, it's yeah. like, you're, you know, many companies are kind of throwing the, um, throwing all the, the responsibility, like putting their hands up to the, to, to the customer. And to me, that's, very much problematic i don't think you know i don't think that's the way things should go it can't be like oh my god i can't believe they did this with my data and they're like oh you should have read these 80 pages of stuff <laughs> before you know yeah i i couldn't agree more i think and that's the that's the problem that we kind of see it's, especially when it comes to managing privacy like like you mentioned if you've got so many different um bits of data that they're so disparate it's it gets impossible to manage um, this is one of the reasons why we've built Pulse in the way that we have. It is an opportunity for individuals to interact with businesses that can provide them the opportunity to aggregate their data into a single platform. Um, now, obviously, that's going to take time. There's a network effect that has to happen with that. But the way in which it's been structured 
um, you know, allows for an organization, you know, it, let's say, for example, an, a, a customer has four or five different accounts with one organization. I'd rather interact with my privacy across all of those in a single interface than I would. This is a phone number for a loan. This is a phone number for a credit card. I mean, why do you need to do that? It's, it's the same organization. You should manage your privacy within that organization across all products in a single way. But, you know, some businesses don't facilitate that. So, um, yeah, that, that's where I would, um, is that answer your question? Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally, totally. Right. I think, you, you know, and uh, thankfully in the EU, you guys have GDPR and, you know, things that, that say that you're supposed to, you know, write privacy policies and things like that in plain language where people really understand where we don't really have laws like that here (laughs) in the U.S. So, I mean, to me, these policies get longer and longer and more complex. And then, you know, obviously some companies, you know, like, for example, Apple, if you look at their privacy policy, it's very simple, right? Um, And it's done that purposely that way um, because they do want people to, to understand. So for me, you know, I always say I like to make privacy a business advantage. You know, this is a huge advantage to businesses if they can be more transparent and create less friction at the yeah. same time with customers. And, you know, you want customers to be informed or you should want customers to be informed uh, because that's how you really build trust. So, you know, you don't want to do this gotcha thing where, oh my goodness, well, I, I tricked this person and they take, you know, giving me this consent and then I did this this crazy thing that I probably shouldn't have done with their data and then we're going to litigate for years and years and years like that's to me that's not a good good way to go forward and like you said you know customers are voting with their feet and they want more transparency and so that's you know I say transparency is the way of the future because if you're not transparent people aren't going to trust you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's really interesting the point you make, you know, where in the US you don't quite have the the same laws as over here in in Europe, for example. But all businesses need trust to build businesses. You know, people need to, whilst the laws might not be there, people understand that their data is being used in ways that they're not happy with. And it shouldn't, the fact that there's nothing there to regulate it shouldn't mean that you think that it's okay to mistreat customers in that way. You've, you've got to manage their expectations. Um, and I think, you know, the growth of privacy tech, the growth of privacy companies is proof that whether the laws are there or not, trust is the essence of business. Like if you don't have it, you can't grow. And that's, that's you know, they, they've got to get things in place to make sure that they um, demonstrate that they care about their customers and their data and, um, you know, how they use it. Yeah, I think it the the mind shift has to change or businesses think complying with privacy is like a tax on their business, where it's yeah. actually something that's going to improve their bottom line because they'll be more attractive to customers. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Like we've um, obviously we've spoken to a lot of um, uh, privacy officers and I think one of the things, you know, this, this is where I was talking about at the start, um, you know, the, the beautiful thing about blockchain, it, it takes back office processes, it moves it front and center to the user experience. And privacy for me is one of those things in front of the um, user journey because you have to click these boxes. And um, it's still considered, well, sits there, it's still back office. And I think some of the privacy officers that we've spoken to have questions because they're unable to make um, the sales teams recognize the revenue that... Um, Privacy can help them unlock just by creating trust. It doesn't need to be revenue because, and it shouldn't be revenue because they're doing things in an unethical way. It's the acknowledgement that ethical behaviors create trust and create more brand comfort and their revenue. It's, it's making people see that link between how I operate as a business um, determines what my revenue um, looks like at the end of the day. So. Yeah, we're definitely seeing that. All right, Wayne. So if it was the world according to Wayne and we did everything that you said, uh, what would be your wish for privacy, data privacy anywhere in the world, uh, whether it's law, technology, about consumers or humans? What are your thoughts? Um, I think for me, 
I th what I'd like to see is a world where businesses don't need regulations to um, be encouraged to manage the trust of their customers. That's where I'd like to see the world. It shouldn't need a regulator to tell you, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that with the data. I know you need to, um, because there are some people who see the opportunities, but I think putting trust at the hearts, putting customers at the heart of the business, but really meaning it um, and using, you know, platforms like Pulse um, and, and other platforms that, you know, other, other um, organizations are, are building at the heart of their business would be a, a good way of, um, of of, of sort of making that happen I think yeah I love that I love that I think I think you're totally right I think you're totally right I think there's a ethical gap here right so yeah. not fortunately not all laws are ethical but um <laughs> the the ethics in you know what's not written on paper what's not in a regulation about what a company decides they want to be like, you know, in their culture and what they do. I think you're right. I think companies that sort of address that ethical issue yeah. uh, will be more successful in the future because yeah. they're saying, you know, we're going to take a stand, you know, even without a regulation and we're going to kind of operate in a certain way to be transparent with the individual and just and that will make them more successful. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, look, when you see, you know, all, sort of the cats out the bag now, you know, there's people there who believe that the world needs to be rebuilt. You know, you've got Web 3.0, you've got DeFi, you've, you've got people who are just going to challenge the way that these existing journeys um, are conducted. And I think for businesses, they need to recognize if they don't act fast, the barriers to entry for, I suppose, challenger organizations in their industries is they've, they've never been lower. And I think, you know, if, if, if this is not addressed sooner rather than later, I think they'll, they'll start to lose market share and, and trust. And yeah, that's not a good place to be. I agree. I agree. Well, this has been a really interesting episode. I re I'm really happy that we got a chance to talk about this. Uh, consent is something that I like to talk about a lot. I think it's just a huge issue. And I'm glad that you guys are, you know, attacking that uh, that challenge uh, and sort of making things more transparent. And I also love the fact that you're, you do have kind of that, that banking background. So to me, there are parallels there uh, or lessons to be learned there um, about transparency and about kind of the customer experience. Yeah, thank you very much. Really Excellent. appreciate you uh, you having me on the on the show, Debbie. It's been great. Yeah, this is great. This is wonderful. So I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. You're welcome.